Bonjour à toutes et à tous. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm not sure whether I'm supposed to speak in French or English. Who can understand French, just to get an idea? Okay, you, so there are still a few people that can't speak French. So, so I will then speak in English. Who can't understand? Qui ne comprend pas l'anglais? Okay, so English it is. Okay, so nice to be with you uh, today. I would like to talk to you about uh, the size of electrolyzers today. Um, you see that uh, the hydrogen uh, business is booming. We went from a couple of years ago from a few megawatts or even kilowatts to a gigawatt. So the size is completely different and the purpose of my today's speech is to uh, discuss together why it's so important to increase the scale. So I will first go through a small introduction of John Cochrane, then what has been happening in our world, um, in the hydrogen world, and of course the world of John Cochrane, and then we'll discuss more about facts about large-scale electrolyzers. So John Cochrane, um, 25 years of experience in hydrogen solutions production and distribution, but 5,000 people worldwide involved in other uh, subjects such as defense, energy, environment, services, 40 nationalities, and you can see the different sectors we're in. It's a private group and uh, extremely reactive um, in the ambition and in what we do uh, regarding our projects and solutions. We are the world number one in water electrolysis, uh, purpose being to produce green hydrogen or decarbonated hydrogen, depending on the source of electricity. We've got 33% of the market share of electrolyzers, not even alkaline, in 2021. Like we said, we've been in the business of hydrogen for 30 years. We've got more than a thousand references in more than 30 countries. And we've got the largest pressurized electrolyzers in the market. In Europe, we supply five megawatt stacks and worldwide, we go even uh, beyond uh, our largest stacks are for now 6.5 megawatts with two references uh, being commissioned in the north of China. We focus on very large scale uh, production. Doesn't mean that we don't address the whole uh, spectrum, but we focus on large scale because we believe this is what a hydrogen economy is requiring with plants going from 100 megawatts to one gigawatt. Large investment plan, and of course, we are also present in the downstream, whether it's power to gas, whether it's uh, mobility, or any industry application. Manufacturing capacities. Um, this is our first plant. Uh, it's in uh, Suzhou, China. It's uh, west of uh, Shanghai. It's got a capacity of 350 megawatts. Um, we are moving towards 500 megawatts and we will increase this capacity next year. We are building currently a new plant, a gigafactory, capacity one gigawatt in ASPAC in the east of France. The uh, bulldozers are in action as we speak. So we started uh, working on, uh, on this plant. The permits, both building permits and operating permits have been granted. So we're going full speed on that project. A few reference references just to show you the, uh, the scale of projects. Uh, on the left hand side, you see the largest project uh, in the world, largest green hydrogen production project in the world. 
with a, a total of 150 uh, uh, megawatts. 110 megawatts have been delivered. And this uh, unit is fueled by a photovoltaic field of one gigawatt. So we think that at the end of the day, this plant will probably reach 500 megawatts. Right now, it's still the, the largest one in operation in the world. Another project uh, closer to where we are, it's in, it's in Belgium, in uh, Charleroi, uh, city of Amaker. It's an NG site, and we have developed together with NG and Carmeuse, the, uh, one of the world leaders in lime production. And what we're doing there, we are producing green hydrogen. We take the CO2, the monon dioxide, uh, carbon dioxide from the fumes coming from the uh, lime kiln. We, through a catalysis, we bring them together and we are making emethane. So it's a project which is under review by the European Commission through different application projects as we stand. Another example, uh, the event just, uh, just took place, the Winter Olympics in, in Beijing. Um, a very large, uh, one of the largest uh, refueling stations in, in the world. Uh, five megawatts, actually six, six megawatts, sorry, six megawatts. Um, and this unit is uh, refueling 85 buses. 25 megawatt reference in uh, Taiwan. Um, this is this time five stacks of five megawatts um, uh, delivering 5,000 noble cubic meter an hour and the application is for the electronic chip industry. So we're here today to talk about large scale. So why, why large scale? Um, well, you can see the momentum between 2020, this is a, a, a McKinsey analysis. Uh, you can see that uh, between 2020 and 2021, you can see the momentum. 228 large projects at the end of 2020. Seven months later, already 359. And the size of the projects have been increasing steadily. We estimate a $200 billion investment between now and 2030, 11 gigawatt projects, and 260 gigawatt of low carbon hydrogen projects have been announced worldwide. And we don't have the figures for 2022, but we know that this is actually accelerating. You probably read in the, uh, uh, through different press releases that uh, Europe uh, has a real focus on hydrogen. Um, we had a, a required capacity of 40 gigawatts by 2030, which was announced. This capacity has been doubled uh, recently, and you can see that in most places in the world, the same momentum is happening. So that means there are very, very large expectations of, because we need to produce electrolyzers to be able to feed that very, very large demand. To feed that very large demand, how can we accommodate it? We need to be able to provide all those uh, countries with large-scale electrolyzers in order uh, to um, answer the demands. Right now, uh, we, uh, John Cochrane has decided to build a total of eight gigawatt of gigafactories worldwide. Uh, two will be in Europe, two, two gigawatts will be in Europe, and other locations in the world will happen. Uh, you saw that China uh, is, is on its way. We've got uh, one of the largest plants already in operations. We are working on two gigawatts in India through an exclusive partnership with Greenco. 
the uh, number one player in renewable energy uh, in, uh, in India. And so this, uh, this, industry, uh, this industry is getting structured and is um, uh, the, uh, the plant deployment is now taking place. So, why do we need um, so much uh, hydrogen? Well, the first thing is that when you look at the three largest uh, consumers of hydrogen, you can see that the demand is huge. First one are the oil refineries. If you take an average uh, refinery, you can see that you will require 340 megawatts of electrolysis. If you take the, sec uh, the second one, ammonia plants, average plant, 100 kilotons a year, almost one gigawatt of green hydrogen would be uh, needed. Still making plants through direct reduction of iron ore, same thing. We see that the quantities of hydrogen are going to be absolutely huge. For an average plant of four uh, million tons of steel produced per year, you will require 1.8 gigawatt of electrolysis. So all of this makes us to believe that the future will be in the gigawatt scale. So we do need to be able to uh, produce uh, plants that will have electrolyzers large enough to accommodate for those large scales. Going the larger size is extremely important for two reasons. At the end of the day, of takers want to produce and to consume hydrogen at the lowest price, lowest LCOH. For this, they need to work both on the capex and opex of the equipment, and of course, the cheapest price of electricity. Us, as a solution provider, we can only accommodate the electricity price. And depending on where we stand in the world, uh, of course, those prices will, will largely vary. But let's get, let's get back to the equipment. If we look at the capex, here we made the exercise to compare a one stack of five megawatts to five smaller stacks of one megawatt. What we did for that comparison, of course, we took the same technology, John Cockrell's technology, in order to make a fair comparison between the two sizes. Now, what do we see? If we look at the overall weight, you can see that you've got double the weight if you increase the number of stacks. Pressure vessels, same thing. The separating unit, you will have exactly the same the same effect. Piping, almost as much. You can see on the right hand side picture two stacks of five megawatts. Here you see five stacks of one megawatt. There was at the time where those large stacks were not available. Instrumentation, you've got five times the, the amount. Why? It's obvious. You need as many pressure uh, uh, pressure measurements, flow rate measurements, etc. Per, per stack. So all the instrumentation is being multiplied. Electrical scope, same thing, you double, double the price. And interesting enough, of course, the footprint, the footprint is much more reduced. When you think that this unit here, I'm not talking about the two, this unit on the right is equivalent to those five stacks. This is about six meter long, two meter in diameter. So you can see the reduction of space that you gain going larger. And of course, regarding OPEX, because you've got less equipment, you've got less instrumentation, also you will save and maintenance operation and less uh, spare parts.
here is a little roadmap of what you can see, and that shows you the acceleration of our business. 30 years ago, we were at 60 normal cubic meter an hour of hydrogen, single stack. This is where we are now, 21, with uh, two large stacks being commissioned for one very, very large uh, energy player. We are at, uh, at 6.5 megawatts, so equivalent of uh, 1,300 uh, number of cubic meters an hour. And this is our roadmap to go to 10 and then 20, 20 megawatts. And this is thanks to this scale acceleration that we will be able to cope with the demand and be able to reply to this type of customers. Right now, they are only putting together pilot plans to be able to test uh, the uh, process to see how they can accommodate uh, green hydrogen. But very, very, very soon, if we want to go to this type of size between 500 megawatts and 1 gigawatt per plant, or even larger, we will need much larger stacks and much larger actualizers. But size is not the only important parameter, as you know. More and more, uh, it is important to go towards green sources of electricity, mainly uh, solar, hydropower, and wind. In the case of hydropower, of course, no problem. You're more or less like in a base load mode. And so there's no intermittency or very little. In the case of solar and wind, here you see a typical curve of a PV, uh, of a PV field. Uh, there will be variations. And so you need, we need to accommodate with this. So we need the ability to be able to adapt the uh, gradient, the production of the electrolyzer, depending of the variations of the stream power. In the case of pressurized alkaline, and only pressurized, if it's atmospheric, doesn't work, you've got a very, very low reactivity, about 0.5% per, per, per second, not fit at all uh, for um, uh, wind or, or solar. But in the case of pressurized alkaline, you can reach up to 5 to 8% per second. And this is plenty to be able to accommodate this type of variations. The nice thing, and of course, everybody is aware about the material crisis right now. Uh, you saw the price of platinum, the price of nickel. All those elements have been um, increasing their value uh, a lot on the market to the point that their valuation actually have been stopped at, at one point because it was uh, going crazy. This is causing a serious uh, issue to, to the world to make sure that the solution that are being put in place uh, have enough um, uh, material uh, to be able to, to, to sustain our future. In the case of alkaline, um, we're using nickel. There's plenty of nickel on, on the earth. The prices are going up, but there's definitely no scarcity. Not like iridium or, or, or to a lesser extent platinum, uh, where prices are going extremely, extremely high. We talked about the decreased footprint. It's important to reduce the number of stacks and to have uh, giga plants that are manageable, where you don't have instrumentations everywhere, piping everywhere, to be able uh, to have uh, uh, maintainable uh, plants. The availability is extremely important. And with this type of, uh, of technology, pressurized alkaline, you already have hydrogen at the outlet of the electrolyzers at 30 or even 50 bars for the uh, smaller uh, sizes uh, that, that, that we have. That's a big advantage because you save a lot of the first levels of compressions. And 
in some areas you can even use directly the, the 30 bars for the final application. But as you know, it requires far less energy to go from 30 to 60 bars than between 0 and 30 bars. So, so that, that's a huge saving in, in, in CapEx, of course, because less compressors, uh, but also in OPEX, because of course, you don't need to operate those compressors. There's no maintenance. Uh, and no electricity consumption. We have some time for, for questions. I believe we've got uh, a, few, a few minutes. Uh, if we don't have time, so somebody will circulate with the mic. And um, in case some questions still remain to be answered, or if you want to talk to me or some of my colleagues, Come and visit us. We are on the other side of the of the building. Uh, in booth M14, you will see a big uh, Cochreal, uh, John Cochreal logo uh, on top of our booth. So you can't miss us. Thank you very much. Uh, hello. Thank you for presentation. I'm Bihan Shi from Total Energies. Uh, Sorry. So one question you mentioned on the slide that the larger size of electrolyzer doesn't need a uh, noble material. Could you elaborate on that? Why is it? Um, actually, this is not dependent on size. Uh, this is strictly because of the technology. The uh, technology, the alkaline uh, technology, doesn't require any rare earth like iridium, like uh, PEM, for example, is requiring such uh, material. Or or platinum. In the case of alkaline, only with nickel, um, we've got everything. So it's strictly steel and nickel. So there's no rare material for whatever size we, we, we do. But of course, as the number of electrolyzers uh, to get out need uh, to increase, it's important that we keep the prices extremely low. And that's a big advantage we have. Thank you for your presentation. My understanding is that the um, uh, PEM is much more expensive than alkaline. Does the uh, uh, I mean, the gain of uh, efficiency uh, compensate for the price difference? Okay, so oh, and at what, you know, from what, what say, I mean, what uh, level of production does it actually compensate? It's, um, it's a very, very, very good question, and uh, we, we get this question a lot from our customers because, yes, they need to make a, to make a choice. Um, I would say in the case of large scale, um, Alkaline has been taking over uh, PEM technology in, in many cases. Why? Um, because, in fact, the efficiency is, is very similar. There's no real gain in efficiency, whatever the technology is. However, uh, the benefit of PEM is really uh, to be able to, uh, to, uh, to start from uh, zero uh, extremely quickly. So you can start a PEM electrolyzer extremely quickly. Um, and it goes also from zero to 100 of nominal power, which is not the case for alkaline. In the case of alkaline, you go from 30 to 40 percent of nominal power all the way to 100. So you're missing the 30-40%. But in the case of large-scale uh, plants, it's not an issue, in fact, because, because of the number of stacks that you have, you can reduce the number of stacks in operation. So for example, if you have 10 electrolyzers, if you shut one down, so all the electrolyzers will go from 40 to 100 of nominal power. But if you work with only one, it's the equivalent of going from 4% to 100% because rather than having 10 stacks, you've got only one stack in operation. So in fact, uh, at the end of the day, it, is, it offers the same flexibility as PEM, uh, the same gradients, uh, lesser gradient but far sufficient for both solar and wind and at a much lesser price. So this is why most large projects now go towards alkaline. Uh, 
Euh, oui, merci. J'ai compris que dans l'alcalin, il y a matériaux, il y a le potasse ou le KOH. Comment vous gérez les risques de fuite euh, Et voilà, comment vous gérez ce point Merci. Ouais. Alors, en fait, c'est en circuit fermé. Uh, so, what, je vais répondre en français, parce que la question était en français. C'est en French. circuit fermé, c'est-à-dire qu'en fait, on vient de temps en temps rajouter un petit peu de, de, de potasse, mais très très peu. Et en fait, on, a, on est complètement en, en boucle fermée. Euh, et il faut simplement faire, euh, faire une, une surveillance des, des fuites éventuellement qu'il pourrait y avoir. Mais, euh, mais c'est extrêmement, euh, extrêmement léger. Non, non, c'est vraiment... Euh, on a, en fait, on n'a pas vraiment de, de circuit ouvert. Tout est, tout, est, tout est en boucle et donc euh, tout, est, tout est fermé. So somebody tells me that um, the, uh, my time is, uh, is over for the... Uh, so if you've got a, First of all, thank you again very much for your, uh, for your questions and your interest. If you wish to uh, continue the discussion, I will be at my uh, booth uh, M14 and it will be uh, a pleasure to meet you there. Thank you very much.